While I make every effort to broadcast correct information, I'm also still learning. I will double check all my facts, but realize that healthcare is a constantly changing science and art. One doctor or healthcare provider may have a different way of doing things from another. I welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. I take no money from supplement or device companies. By listening to this podcast or reading this blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice or to treat any medical condition, neither yourself or others including but not limited to patients that you are treating. Consult your healthcare provider for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast or the website. Under no circumstances shall any guests or contributors to the podcast or blog or any employees, associates, or affiliates of the Boss Body podcast be responsible for damages arising from use of the podcast or the blog. This blog or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limiting to, limited to establishing the standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or the blog. Hey guys, it's Dr. Tim Jackson with another episode of the Boss Body Podcast, Functional Medicine. We've talked about it a lot. We've had a lot of subject matter experts on the show. Today, we have an expert in overcoming chronic illness, mold toxicity, stealth pathogens such as Lyme, Babesia bartonella. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jill Carnahan. Thank you, Dr. Tim. I am glad to be here. Absolutely. So you had a book that came out in 2023, Unexpected. Tell us a little bit about that and what um, resonated with you to cause you to write it. So it's great because that's really the foundation of why I do what I do. Um, you know, I was, uh, uh, I didn't really know I was going to be a physician, but I guess I kind of knew I was going to be a healer. I grew up in a farm in central Illinois, one of five children. Um, you know, we had organic vegetables and a really holistic lifestyle. But what I didn't realize was the farm chemicals were slowly poisoning me. And it wasn't until I was a medical student, third year medical student at Loyola in Chicago, where I found a lump in my breast. I didn't think anything of it, Tim. I was just like, hmm, you know, but at the insistence of my husband at the time, I went and had it checked out. The radio, uh, radiologist basically looked at me and said, you know, if you were 55 year old, this is likely cancer, but you're 24. I just, just about turned 25 and this is likely not serious, but you need a biopsy. But, you know, that was the moment when I knew something was wrong. I saw it in his eyes, the concern. And as a medical student, what we do is we learn. So we went like I went into the radiologist office with him and looked at the exams and looked at the, the images and everything. So I knew right then there, there was something serious. I went and had a biopsy. And just a couple of days later, I got a call from the surgeon and she said, Jill, you have aggressive breast cancer. Um, you're in for the fight of your life. Uh, and it's funny because Tim, many people have relatives or even themselves or family members that have had breast cancer, but what many people don't realize is in their twenties and thirties, women, it's a death sentence. Um, I was in a group of young women under 40 in Chicago, and I'm the only one still living. So it's, it was really a battle for my life. I didn't know how big a deal it was, would be. And I had this holistic mindset. So even though I was in allopathic medical school training, um, the, the truth was I really wanted a more holistic approach, but I went ahead and had aggressive chemotherapy, three drugs, radiation, surgery. And about nine months later, I came out and I thought I was healed and doing well and getting ready to go back onto rotations. And then over the next six months, I experienced um, fevers, fatigue, uh, weight loss, and six months later, I was in the ER taking a patient's blood pressure and I passed out cold on the floor. I ended up in the hospital for emergency surgery for an abscess, waking up to the surgeon saying, Jill, you have Crohn's disease. <laughs> so the reason I wrote the book was, I, and there's more, but my story, I didn't realize this until, you know, looking back as 2020, but as a healer, we often go through our own journeys. And my journey has absolutely been to experience cancer, to experience autoimmunity, to experience mold toxicity, and many other things, including traumatic relationships and trauma in general. And all of those things, each part of the way, have taught me some deep lessons, more powerful than any medical school training. And so what I did in the book is I told my story, but in that story is the every person because we all have issues with illness. We all have issues with our uh, uh, family of origin. We all have issues with trauma. We always, all have issues with achievement or loving ourselves or being worthy or all those things. So I wrapped it all into the book. And my hope is that the reader will really feel 
um, their own journey and have pearls and tips and tools to get through it? It's kind of like, um, it reminds me of Dr. Howard Elkin, the cardiologist yeah. in mm -hmm. California. He wrote um, from both sides of the table or from the other side of the table, you know, because he had that major stressor in his life. But um, it reminds me of that word I know you've written a lot about, and that's resiliency yes. or resilience. So when you had those issues in medical school, I mean, medical school is stressful enough, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> were you able, I mean, obviously you finished, but how did that change the trajectory of your training? Yeah, well, you know, that was the first real lesson because I had grown up in a German Swiss, hardworking, don't complain, pull it by the bootstraps, farm family, like farm stock, you know, mm -hmm. I was surrounded by brothers. And so I was a pretty tough girl, or at least I had to be or thought I was. The truth was, Tim, I was actually a super empathetic, like feminine, um, you know, feeler. And I kind of suppressed all of that and took on this idea. It's almost like you raise a bear in a wolf pack or, you know, one of these kind of analogies. And I was in this wolf pack and I became a wolf. And, and again, I have that too. I have strength. I have stamina. I have determination. I have stubbornness. But there is a part of me that I kind of denied and put to the side and thought, oh, I'm going to go through medical school. And what you just alluded to is medical training is brutal. And it was when I went through it, like the hours, the, the lack of compassion for self is actually part of the core makeup. Because when you are on a surgery rotation, it is like touted to see who can go the most without sleep, without food, without pain. Like you're a great resident. If you can uh, you hold your bladder for 12 hours during surgery, or you can go without sleep for 36 hours and then still perform. Those are things that are touted. And so in that environment, it just reinforced my idea that I had to be tough and strong and uh, not complain. And so what happened with the cancer was all of a sudden I was facing this life-threatening illness. And initially I actually was like, so silly. I thought, oh, I'm going to do my, my uh, chemo, my radiation, and no one will ever know. I won't even stop rotations. Well, the first chemo was flat on my bed and so nauseous and so sick that I realized very quickly, there is no way I'm going to be able to function. Then I lost all my hair. I lost 25 pounds. And so it was very clear I needed to take a leave of absence. And that was the first like, wait a second, you can't, I mean, you can mentally overcome, but you have to kind of acquiesce to life and what's happening. And part of that is that toughness mentality serves us well, right? Like our achievement and our drive. And there's so much power and beauty in that. But on the other side of the coin was what I learned through that first experience was it's okay to ask for help and your worth and value did not depend on you performing and achieving. And that's been a lifelong lesson for me. Absolutely. And so your residency was in family medicine? Yeah. Okay. And so when did you start transitioning more to functional medicine? I know you're not allowed as a resident to really even talk about that stuff. I had a colleague who was both an MD and a chiropractor or is an MD and a chiropractor. And he said during residency, you know, he has a patient on 14 medications and she hasn't had a bowel movement in six days. And he's like digestive enzymes. And they're like, yes. Yeah. What? <laughs> oh, yeah. So I um, went to medical school and really kind of tried to deal with the model, but I was very different in that at Leola, they had never really had integrative programming. And I created an integrative medical club and we brought in chiropractic massage therapy, physical therapy, acupuncture, some of the other modalities. And at that time it was called alternative, which I hate that word because I think yeah. they're equal, um, but they were alternative. And then we called it integrative. And so I was part of changing the medical school curriculum in a small way while I was there. Um, and then I got out in residency and that's when I heard Jeff Bland, who is of course the father of functional medicine. And many people have the story like I do. And I was like enthralled. I was like, who is this guy? He's talking about biochemical pathways and root cause. And so what happened to me happened to many docs like me and the fact that Jeff Bland had given a name to what we wanted to do. Like I always wanted to heal people and go to root cause and really deal with the underlying metabolic imbalances. And I think most people going into medicine do want that. They want to be healers. But we, um, you know, the pharmaceuticals and all that kind of stuff in medical school kind of overshadowed. So when I first heard Jeff Bland, I was in residency and I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. <laughs> I knew it. Right. And so I started, um, all I knew then was I did the integrative um, fellowship training in Arizona first, 
And then I started okay. doing some functional training. It was at the very beginning. Um, and you know, what's neat is you're right. Most medical schools do not allow any of the alternative, but in my residency, they were open enough and trusted me enough that I started like checking all the thyroid labs and I started replacing menopausal women's hormones, which again was very unheard of. So yeah, very that's rare. basic, right? Basic, but I was allowed. So what happened is I have this residency clinic, which is like inner city, usually underserved populations. And I'm having like the suburban housewives come in to see me at the resident clinic because they knew <laughs> that I was the somehow found out their, their friends told them. So it was funny. They're like, who, you know, why are all these ladies right. coming to see Dr. Jill? Um, so, but it was a good experience because I did kind of start to get to integrate it just a little bit. And then I came out of, here's another part of the story in the book. That's just crazy. Looking back, I came out of residency. I knew the hospital and loved the hospital where I worked. And I went to the CEO and I said, you know what, you know, I've been here and worked hard and I know you, and I'd love to work for you. But I said, there's three big hospitals in Peoria. They all compete. I said, what if you created something that no one else has? What if you created an integrative medical center? I'll be your medical director. I'll help you establish it, build it and everything. And uh, you'll have something that no one else has. It gives you the edge and it's, it's up and coming. And he was a champion. He saw the future like I did. And he was like, let's do it. We signed a contract. And so over the next several years, I actually sat with architects and builders and designers and, and administration in the hospital. I literally helped them build an integrative wow. medical center, became the medical director. And for several years, that was my first start. And it was amazing just because I got to see how it worked. But one of the crazy things, and this will make sense to you as well, um, I was in a board meeting one day. This was maybe two years in. And they were putting statistics on the board and they had the gastroenterology head, the integrative medical head, which is me and the rheumatology and all the departments. And they were talking about statistics and the statistics were number of beds filled by each department. Guess who was like at the bottom? Me. And I'm like looking at this like, oh, wait a second. I'm not doing very well, but wait a second. That's what I want to do. Like, I want to keep right. people out of the hospital. So two things helped me like shift out of that. Number one was that meeting. I was like, wait, we are not on the same wavelength and we never will be. And if my right. goal is to keep you out of the hospital, I will never, ever be an asset to you. And then number two, I was starting to realize they still had me in the same paradigm of productivity, like 20, 30 patients a day. And as you so well know, with integrative functional medicine, we need time to get to know the patient. And I was drowning. I was back to the workaholism because every night I'd stay for hours to finish charting because right. there's no way you can do justice to this kind of medicine and see 30 patients a day. Right. Absolutely. I mean, and, you know, what you said about no sleep in medical school, Dr. Rob Downey said when he was in medical school, the mantra was, if you're not falling asleep at the nurse's station at 1 or 2 a.m., then you don't really want to be a doctor. But he said, you know, the opposite is actually true. And I agree. I mean, it doesn't serve the patients and it certainly doesn't serve the doctors. I mean, more errors are committed. You know, people are going to die because of medical errors. And, you know, you end up with autoimmune, neuroimmune, um, metabolic syndrome, all those things. And I know me, when my sleep gets thrown off for one night, I'm like out of it the next day. So I can't imagine like, you know, the surgical um, rotations that, surgeons go through and the training, you know, especially first and second year when you're on call, like every third night or whatever. And so when you left that integrative hospital or medical center, is that when you opened Flatiron Functional Medicine? Yeah. So two things coincided. I was there and I was medical director and in my mind, it was the perfect situation. I was so happy. They were starting to feature me as the you know, new up and coming doc in the town. And it was really beautiful. That's all ego, right? Um, my husband, who's now my ex-husband and we're friends, but at the time he came to me and said, Jill, I think I'm supposed to move to Colorado to do a new job with this friend. What do you think? Well, my first answer was no way. I just got this medical directorship. We built a clinic. They spent millions of dollars to do this. Like I can't leave. But after I prayed and meditated on it, I kind of realized, oh, maybe this is my out. And so my next step was to go to the CEO who had believed in me and been my best advocate and say, oh, I want to leave, right? Well, Tim, this was my answer because I had this first call with him. I said, um, Michael, I know you have poured into me. I love what, what you've done, but I think long-term this isn't a good fit. And my husband wants to move to Colorado and, um, you know. And, you know, without a, a pause, he said, well, Jill, you know, we loved having you. We love what you've done here, but I want you to do what's best for you and I will support you. And I was just like, whoa, 
<laughs> but yeah. that to me was such a bit like it, I did not expect that at all. But that to me was the sign of like, okay, he's releasing me with grace because it is going to be a cost and, you know, cumbersomeness to him and the company. But it was the best move I ever made because later that whole part of the hospital and clinic, he left and he was my advocate. So it probably saved me. But that was when I moved to Colorado to start my own practice. Um, and I started from scratch. I mean, this was not getting a job or a salary. I always say to new practitioners, if you have practitioners who listen, um, that it took me about 18 months to make a profit. I mean, and I'm not talking a profit to live on or just a profit period. <laughs> and so you have to be prepared. And I was, and I started in one room with Dr. Bob Roundtree, who was gracious enough to give me space in his office. I'm always going to be grateful to him because he was so generous to allow me to have that space, very low rent. Um, but you don't need to start big. And then right. my my way of, of getting out there in the world, because no one knew me in Colorado, was, okay, I'm going to start writing. So on the side, I would write you know, monthly, once or twice a month, a blog and put that out online. Um, and that just started to bring some traffic in. Awesome. And now I know you have people flying in from all over the country and out of the country, correct? Yeah. Yeah. We have a five-year wait list. I'll, I have a new nurse practitioner and a PA that's going to be coming on board and we're growing and definitely busy. Awesome. And so we talked about cancer. Obviously that's an immune system imbalance, but then I know you work a lot with autoimmunity slash neuroimmunity and mold toxicity, which leads to neuroimmunity. Tell us a little bit about that and your experience with mold toxicity. Sure. Well, I'll just go from Crohn's to mold because Crohn's was, it's funny though, there are some technical people that say Crohn's is maybe not an autoimmune disease, but say it is. I also had Hashimoto's. I definitely had that autoimmune realm. And just one comment on that, and then we'll go to mold. So we talked about like the mind body in this. And one thing I always feel so important from Gabor Mate's work, he talks specifically about autoimmunity and trauma and our own self-beliefs. And I think one of the things that's so critical with autoimmunity to understand as part of the process is the fact that autoimmune by nature is autoimmune. It's attack of self. It's when our own immune system goes rogue, gets irritable like an angry wolf and starts to create antibodies that again are against our own tissues, like our thyroid, our nerves, our joints or whatever. And so in that process, granted, we have to go to the gut because with the triad of autoimmunity, we know there's genetics. We know there is a gut immune interface. So usually there's a leaky gut problem and a gut immune stimulation, overstimulation. And then there's usually environmental triggers, which could be as simple as gluten or as complex as toxic heavy metals or mold. And those things, three things are always present in every autoimmune disease. And that's on the physical level, functional medicine. But this other level that Dr. Gabor Mate talks about is self-hatred, self-loathing. And maybe you're listening, you're like, well, I have autoimmunity and disease and I love myself, but there's often parts of ourselves that we kind of relegate, maybe the angry little girl that we're like, well, that wasn't appropriate. So anger is, we don't like that part of ourselves, or we don't like parts of our body. And so healing those parts of ourself and really loving and accepting every single part of ourself is part of the process with autoimmune disease. Yeah, absolutely. I know Dr. Dietrich Klinghart, he says for every level of physical toxicity, there's at least one to three levels of emotional and psychological toxicity. Oh, so true. Yeah. And, and I feel like years ago, I was all biochemical, analytical engineer kind of background. Love that. But the real power has become when I started to at least ask, I'm not an expert in, in therapy or somatic therapy, but I know who is. And so I'll do referrals. So it doesn't mean that you're, you know, you have to know all those places of where to go, but if you can recognize that and just call it out and ask the patient, would you like to go this direction? That will really empower them. And so a lot of those somatic kind of based therapies have been game changers for myself and my patients, which is a good segue into mold because mold is one of the most toxic, traumatic things known to man. So mold illness started for me in an office that we moved, Bob and I moved from North Boulder to South Boulder. And uh, 2013, there was a massive flood in Boulder, epidemic proportions. I had already had kind of an older office and didn't realize it, but uh, number one, there's an unfinished crawl space with standing water right under my office. Down in the basement, which was two levels down, there was bulk stacky batteries growing, which only grew faster and more after the flood. And then my office was actually um, remodeled and my contractor had the bright idea to put uh, soft bamboo flooring over old nasty carpet, just right over it. 
So every step that you took, you were puffing up this gross stuff. Again, I had no clue back then. So it probably was the perfect storm for the flood to come in and create more mold because about six to 12 months after the mold, I started having itchy eyes, rashes, immune issues, every single illness that came around, I'd get sick. Um, I started having you know sore throat, cognitive issues, like word finding, um, brain fog, those kinds of things. And I knew something was wrong, Tim, but I just wasn't quite sure what. Um, I knew it could be environmental. And eventually I was broke down enough that I looked at my urine mycotoxins. We had an inspector come in and everything matched up. I had trichosethenes, which are nasty black mold toxins in my urine. And we found black mold in the basement of the office. And it was literally the day after Christmas when I got all the data back in 2014. And I never again set foot in my office. I literally walked away. Um, with the help of my staff, we of course had patient records and we went to temporary space, but that was when I really had to get serious about how do I heal from mold? Cause I was very sick. And what did you, do you mind sharing with us some of the therapeutic modalities you use like IV therapy, healing the cell membrane? Yeah. So number one uh, always is getting away from the exposure. Now, not everyone has to walk out of their house and leave everything they own. And I want to be really clear because I think that actually is a misnomer and is causing more harm in the you know mold okay. groups and stuff. Uh, because many, many times you can clean, you do have to do a really good job, but many times people can stay in their house. You need a proper remediation. So you need to take out the source of the mold. You need to find it first, take out the source. And then once you take out the source, cut everything out, you must fog and clean to get the residual dust and debris out of the house. Because even though it's like a dried flower arrangement, if you flick it or blow on it and everything shatters into a million pieces, those fragments of old dead mold will still cause immune issues in someone right. who's sensitive. So that's kind of the, the um, way to do it. If you have a ton of books, like on my shelf back here, or you have a lot of paper from office products, that's going to be real hard to clean. So generally I say store it, put it in plastic storage bins, get rid of those things. For me, my paper charts, which at the time, I was using paper charts, still kept me sick for the three or four months until we scanned them. So I got out of that office, but that paper every day would bother me. Um, so it's real important. Um, if there's no way to get out or, or to fix the problem, you might need to leave. But most things, your desk, your computers, your your surfaces, you can clean those things. And even clothing. I, I don't think I gave got rid of hardly any clothing. I cleaned it. You can wash it. So I want to frame that first. And that's the first step is getting out of exposure. Because when your bucket, we talk about toxic load. You've talked about this too. And that's the our ability to detoxify is almost like a bucket full capacity that we're born with. And over our lifetime, as that fills up with you know chemicals from the farm and then mold toxicity and then chemotherapeutic agent, I'm talking for me, all of a sudden you're over your head in water and you're drowning. And when yeah. you're um, uh, overloaded with toxic load, it presents with cancer, with autoimmunity and neurodegenerative diseases, the top three. So I was definitely in that place. And in order to heal and bring that water level down, you must get out of that exposure. Otherwise you're just adding to the bucket and it's like bailing out a boat that's leaking. Right. Step number one. Step number two, your detox system is made for a purpose and we it works really well when we support it. So we need biotransformation, which is our liver gallbladder to work. Um, so we need to, if we've been inhaling these um, through our nose, um, mycotoxins, most of those are 2.5 microns or smaller. So what they do is they go right in our nasal passages. Some of them can literally go through the cribriform plate into our brain directly without any um, bio transformation. And the second thing that they can do is go into our alveoli, into our bloodstream directly through the alveoli without transport because they're very small. And I say that because typically if we ingest something, it goes through our bloodstream to the liver and that filters out some of the toxicity. With mold mm -hmm. toxins, inhalation, there's no filter like that. Right. So we get a direct, then it goes into our tissues. So we get accumulation in the tissues and the tissues will hold all kinds of parabens, phthalates, PCBs, et cetera, but also mycotoxins. So then you get out of the exposure, you need to decrease that toxic load. You have to mobilize it from the tissues. That would include dry brushing, infrared sauna, Epsom salt baths, maybe cold plunge therapy, anything to mobilize tissues, movement, sweat, et cetera. Um, and things like glutathione, which will is our master detoxifier from our liver. We make it, but we can always add more either liposomal oral, IV. You can do it nebulized. You can do it injectable. Mm -hmm. There's 101 ways to get more glutathione. And there's also precursors. When I was sick, I didn't tolerate glutathione because I was oxidizing it all. So instead I took vitamin C, I took glycine, I took glutamine, I took um, NAC, I took lipoic acid, everything else, which supports that liver gallbladder. 
And then when that liver takes a toxin that's fat soluble from your tissues, transforms it into a water soluble, excretes it into the bile, that gallbladder holds that bile and squeezes it out when you eat or between meals sometimes. And then that bile is what carries the toxins and it's very efficient, that recirculation. It's about 95% of that will be reabsorbed. So you are you have a toxic mer- merry-go-round if you don't do something about that bile. And that's where binders come in and we can use things like prescription cholestyramine or Wellcall, um, or we can use natural substances like clay, charcoal, zeolite, glycomannan, chlorella, um, even... Um, some of the herbs and things. So there's lots and lots of things we can use to bind and pull those out through the stool. Yeah, I, a colleague gave me a copy of Richie Shoemaker's book, Mold Warriors in 2009. And his father-in-law at the time was a PhD researcher at the NIH doing research on alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, but not for the reasons you and I care about it. He was looking at it for tanning, which I mean, that's a cool benefit, but like I want the anti-inflammatory benefits. Right. And so uh, mold was on my radar since 2009, but I didn't really have it hit me personally until 2011. And um, I had, I tested positive for Lyme. I, I was functional because I did so many things for my health, but at the time Pharmacin Labs was still in existence and I did yes. an immune tolerance test. Uh, I wanted to see my interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, interleukin-1-beta, and they were all elevated. And I was about to go and see a patient and one of the staff members grabbed me. She's like, you might want to see these results. And they were mine because they came around and gave every provider a free test. And it said positive. But everyone I talked to, I reached out to a lot of people. They said, the Lyme will be much easier to treat if you get rid of the mold first. And I'd done a metametric stool test. And it had plus three for um, yeast fungi. But then underneath, there was a little asterisk that said, could represent ingested or inhaled mold. And wow. so then I did, uh, at the time, real-time labs mm-hmm. um, with a glutathione push beforehand. Wow. My gliotoxin was very, very elevated. And I mean, I've always had not a photographic memory, but pretty close. Um, and I was starting to have brain fog and all sorts of things. And I think that's one thing. I've never tested someone that didn't have at least one mycotoxin that was elevated. And people say, oh, well, I don't smell anything or I don't see anything. I'm, well, most of the time you don't. I mean... Black mold, it's, yeah, it's extremely dangerous, but it's kind of a blessing because you can see it, yes. whereas it gives you a false sense of security if you have aspergillus, things yeah. like that, that you can't necessarily see. So uh, I had Nathan Crane on the show, and he talked about his um, friends in integrative oncology and how they're testing their patients for urine mycotoxin levels now, since you know we can do all the immune therapies in the world, but if it's being blocked by these mycotoxins... Do you do a lot of provoked urine mycotoxin testing? I do, Tim. And I, but gosh, I love your story because it's back in those days when we only had, like now we have different types of tests, right? But yeah. you just described all the stuff we I started using right. too. So metametrics and the um, Barnes oh, yeah. Labs. Yeah, and, and I do that same thing for, so I also have had Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia. So, and, and I think that's a really important point. So the order of operations matters. Here's what I think, limbic systems first. Now I don't do limbic system, but I know how to refer people to it. And there was some articles as I wrote my book, I looked literally in PubMed that talk about chemical inhalation of this noxious substances like mycotoxins triggering separate from our, like, like we might be like, I'm fine and you've got great therapists and you have no emotional trauma, which who has no emotional trauma, right? right. But say, say for, for example, you had no emotional trauma, you would still chemically, limbically be triggered by mold. And when I saw that, I'm like, oh, no wonder. Because I think like 100% of patients who have had a toxic mold exposure have some sort of like a trauma, a PTSD around it. And I always wonder, because a lot of them are very, very healthy emotionally. They don't need a lot of work. But what I realized is, oh, this is a chemical trigger. So all that to say is that there's this limbic system burst. You have to start that in the background, some sort of work to, because our body, if it doesn't feel safe, it won't heal, right? (laughs) So working on that safety message in the background, mast cell activation, which of course you work with and know as well, is such a number one trigger. When I talked to um, Theo Thea Harides from Boston, and then um, uh, who's the other, there's a couple other docs that really do a lot of the work around mast cell. And they have all said, even if they're not a functional kind of doc, mold is the biggest trigger. So mold is a massive trigger of mast cell activation. And many times like my rashes, my itchy eyes, my uh, leaky gut, those were all actually mast cell, not direct mold, like mold caused it, but it was more than mast cell activation. So number two is 
because you can't do a lot of treatments if your mast cells are so activated and irritated. And when you first start mobilizing from the tissues and then getting excretion of those toxins, you're going to get a little exposure. So if you're not able to tolerate that with your mast cells, I feel like you need to calm it down first. Third is the mold because that toxic load, I feel like, and we know things like mycophenolic acid, which is one of the urinary mycotoxins, it's used as cell sub, which is the drug for transplant organs to suppress our immune system. So we know most of these mycotoxins are highly immunosuppressive. So why wouldn't, if you had old Epstein-Barr, varicella, Lyme, Bartonella, et cetera, those things are going to pop up because you have no immune system, even cancer. So the second thing is deal with that toxic load, deal with that mold, get that out of the body, like you said. And then I find, I don't know, maybe 30 to 50% of people um, still need treatment for infections. And many people, including myself, don't need aggressive treatment for the infections if you get rid of the toxic load. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the movie, what's it called? Under Our Skin with Dr. Jimzik. So I used to practice out of that building, in Huntersville, North Carolina. Um, it was after he left, but you know he was doing IV antibiotics and everything. And I think he's a great guy, but something's really suspicious because the South Carolina board went after him and not because the patient complained, but the insurance companies, then, or excuse me, the North Carolina board. Then he went across the border into South Carolina, and then that board went after him. Now he's in D.C. and no one's bothered him. So it's a little odd. But to your point about the antibiotics, I think if you don't catch the bite, you know, from a tick, which you rarely do because such a small percentage get the erythema migrants, then the antibiotics are going to work minimally at best. Mm -hmm. And we now and, know whether it's mold or, or these things, it's often just, just like we know from post-COVID, COVID taught us a lot and, and just reaffirmed what you and I already know. Often it's a trigger that triggers mm -hmm. immune, innate immune response. And then that innate immune system goes crazy, IL-6, IL-2, TNF-alpha. And it's actually those cytokines that are causing the damage, not the original infection, right? Yeah. One of my mentors, Dr. Kendall Stewart in Austin, Texas, you know, he taught me in 2011 about cytokine storms. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was the first time I'd really heard the term. But, you know, during COVID, it became sort of a buzz phrase. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's what makes us feel sick. Like when we're on the couch from a cold, it's cytokine induced sickness behavior. You know, your body goes into a state of torpor, right? So I've had colleagues describe the immune system as it does a great job at learning, but a pretty terrible job at unlearning. Yes. And that gets into the whole topic of immune hypervigilance. Yeah. So what are some ways you go about, like, obviously we talked about removing the triggers, but other ways to calm down the mass cells? Yeah. So um, this always, in my opinion, takes layers because it's, there's almost no one that responds to one thing or it's very mild. Um, naturally, buffered C, vitamin C is great. Quercetin, Chinese skullcap, luteolin. Um, those are some of my top favorites. Uh, B propolis can be helpful. Uh, turmeric in some people, but I feel like some people actually have a histaminic response to turmeric. So I'm not as fond of that one, but I do like um, boswellia. So those are kind of the list of natural stuff. And of course, like plenty of mag and zinc and the basics there, uh, methylated bees because you need methylation to break down histamine. Some people have more food reactions and those would be like DAO enzyme related. Right. That's pretty specific, like it's not necessarily the systemic. So um, the systemic reactions, I don't think specifically respond to DAO a lot unless you're deficient, but a low histamine diet can be really helpful. I'll just tell you something interesting. When I had the Crohn's and I healed from the Crohn's, one of the things I didn't even know it, but I was going on a low histamine diet because all the fermented foods, all the high histamine foods were bothering me. And now in hindsight, I'm like, oh, everything I avoided that helped me was high histamine. So way back when I had a histamine issue and didn't know it. So low histamine diet can be essential temporarily to calm that down. And then um, drugs, I think are important and I use them all the time, starting with H1 blockers like Zyrtec, um, Allegra, Claritin, Benadryl, et cetera, hydroxyzine, um, and maybe next adding H2 blockers right now. I think Pepsid is the one on the market. Um, and then Katadafen is a mast cell stabilizer, kind of unique. That's my absolute favorite kind of go-to. People respond really well to that. Um, uh, Montelukast is another mast cell stabilizer and the big guns in some cases, I mean, I've had people who literally can't eat and they're like, like life or death steroids, um, immune modulating drugs. Some of those big, you know, Zolaire and things are really powerful for those cases where someone's, I mean, I actually start the preface of my book is about a 20 something young girl who had such severe Lyme and mast cell activation that she died. And I kind of put it in there because I wanted the humanity of us as healers to show that no matter how hard we try, sometimes no matter what we do is not enough. And it wasn't 
you know, like it was a 40 plus doctors who had tried, but the truth is like, these can be very serious, very, very serious. And in a young person who's otherwise healthy. And I think that's important to realize it's not. And because of that, sometimes I use steroids. Sometimes I use things that I would normally love to use because it's a life-saving measure. Um, IVIG can be really powerful too in those situations or plasmapheresis. Those are some of the big guns. Right. What types of IV therapy do you do in your clinic? So um, I had a naturopath who was offering all the IVs. She is no longer with us at the moment. So I actually, at the moment, am not offering IVs, but we have offered um, all the classical Myers cocktail, vitamin C, high dose C, um, all the minerals, um, NAD. And I have protocols for PC that, again, as soon as we get someone in there, I'd like to, that's, you started talking about that. I didn't go on with it, but membrane stabilization is so huge because mold destroys our phospholipid membranes, which is every cell, every communication. So as people heal, now phospholipids make things liposomal. So they aid in the passage of things through tissues. So if you're super toxic in the beginning, I don't do a ton of PC until the gut is a little bit more stable and the membranes, leaky mitochondria, leaky brain, leaky gut are a little bit healed because I think you can actually make it a little worse, a little more overly loaded if you do PC too early because you're just dumping stuff into the bloodstream and an already overloaded liver, even if it's, you know, vitamins and minerals can be too much. Absolutely. What are something, one or two things that you know today that you wish you would have known 10 to 12 years ago? Um, resilience is an inside job and no one can do it for us. And so no matter what kind of healer you have working with you or, or what kind of team you have, ultimately it's your mindset. It's your belief that something else is possible that gets you well. And yes, the supplements, the vitamins, the IV, the, the prayer, the meditation, all that's powerful. But ultimately, if you don't believe you're going to get well, you won't. And if you believe that you will get well, nothing's going to stop you. And that power of the subconscious mind is to me, the biggest definition of resilience And number two is a really practical thing, sleep. There is nothing, that is my secret weapon. I will do everything to maintain and keep good sleep. I track it. I do interventions. I do sleep well, so I'm lucky, but I I make it a priority. And I make it such a priority that there are things in my life I say no to just because it'll affect my sleep. And I have no qualms about it because it is my superpower. And I think if more people took sleep that seriously, and we talked in the beginning, right? Like as a resident, it's, it's impaired and it affects us. So I think sleep is a superpower that we should all like make a number one priority. Oh, I agree. I mean, I have my blue blockers that I'll put on here in a little while because I'm on the East coast. Um, but when people say, Hey, do you want to go to this club or that bar? I'm like, well, does it close at nine? Yes. I'll go if it closes <laughs> at nine. Otherwise I'm out because yeah. yeah, I mean, if you're not sleeping, you can't heal anything. Absolutely. Well, Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come on the show. And we're going to put all your links and contact and social media up on the podcast episode on the website. And hopefully we can have you back on in the future. Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Tim, so much. Thank you for the work. Thanks, Dr. Jill. You're welcome. Take care.